Oh, good morning, Epic Church. How is everybody today? Man, it's good to be back home. I love you guys. Um, high five somebody as you sit down and tell them it's going to be an epic day. <laughs> uh, a couple of things. If you're a first time guest with us, I assure you for watching that video, you will not go to hell. Um, there are a lot more reasons that will go than that right there. Um, we do believe that church should absolutely be fun. Everybody say fun. And I don't think that there is anywhere on the planet like um, Epic Church. There's nothing like being at home. The worship here, the atmosphere here is just so welcoming and so powerful, which is a testimony to all of you guys and you coming to expect God to do something great and powerful. So thank you for being the most amazing church on the planet. We have dearly missed all of you. Uh, so we are at our campus in Africa. It's doing great. Thank you so much for sewing into them. Powerful things are happening. Um, and then we went on a little side tour and came back through the country of Spain, which if you ever have an opportunity to go to Spain, please go. It's a very, very beautiful country. But there is, have you ever heard this saying, there's no place like home? There's just, there's no place like Alabama, mostly because there's no heat on the planet that can compare to this place. We stepped off the plane in Hot Atlanta. Have you ever been to Hot Atlanta? And the, and the humidity sucked the life out of everything that we had gained in Africa. It's just like, oh my gosh, why am I wet right now? <laughs> okay, so, but it's, it's great to be home. Also, if you're a first-time guest, just want to say this, or if you're logged in and watching online, we believe here at Epic that worship is just as important as the Word. So if you're ever wondering how come we spend so much time in worship, I want you to know that worship is designed by God to prepare the human heart to receive the Word. So we don't think one is more important than the other. We, we put a lot of emphasis on both. So you're, gonna, you're about to get the word. We're going to read some words of Jesus today. But I don't want you to ever bypass or get bored or not understand the, the reality of the power that sets inside worship. It is a place that kind of gets rid of all the junk. How many of you know that on Sunday you can bring junk in here, even though it's your day off, and you're, but you come in here sideways, you beat the kids, you've done everything that you can to get here on time, and you're still running late, and there's all these, all these voices that tell you, hey, there's no need to go to church, you can watch it online, so thankful you're online, but there's nothing like being, if I say here, so thank you for being here today, but understand that worship does pave the way for what we're about to talk about, and speaking of talking about, how many of you ever said anything that you wish you didn't say? How many of you ever had that moment where some words left your mouth, hit the ears of another, and you're like, oh, that's not going to be good. Like, they're, they're really not going to receive that. How many, how many of you ever had somebody say something to you, and you looked at them and said, oh, you know, I wish you hadn't said that. Like, I, I could have lived my whole life without you even pointing that out or having that discussion or opening that up. How many of you are married? Happens to you all, happens to you all the time, doesn't it? Men, how many of you say stuff you know you shouldn't have said? Just yesterday, like it was like, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. But it, but it comes out. And that's the title of the series that we're jumping into for the next, counting today, for the next five weeks. Things that we wish Jesus had never said. There are things inside, lined and listed through scripture that are super challenging to us. Some of them are hard to embrace. Some of them are hard to swallow. Some mess with our doctrine and our denominations and, and the churches that we form. So we're going to do the best that we can to go through some of those things that the creative team has put together and say, this is, this is a tough one to deal with. This is a tough one to deal with. So next week, the title is, Blessed Are Ye When Shade Is Thrown. Hashtag mean tweets. So um, if you know what that means, great. If you're of the generation, you go, I don't, I don't even know what a hashtag is. Then you'll really want to be here because we're going to educate you on multiple levels. Um, but there is a truth that people talk about you on social media without ever mentioning your name. How many, how many have ever done that? Have you ever done that? Like just sent a little tweet, a little Facebook message out, a little Instagram picture, and all your friends you know you're talking about, but you never really named them. Have you ever done that? Come on, Grayson, raise your hand. Okay, so like, we, we've all done that to some extent, and, it, and it's been done to us. So we're going we're gonna to talk about where that actually happens in Scripture. And then week three, we're going to cover a title called Akuna Matata. We know what's 
movie that's from. If you have children, you already know. You're like, yes. How many of you can sing the song right now? Don't do it. Just want to know if you can. Okay. Maybe, maybe not. The band will do that live. I hope so. But uh, then week four, Jesus don't play. Week five, mo money and mo problems. So what does that mean? You'll not want to miss a single week. If you're away on vacation, so excited. You should be. Hope God refreshes you. But make your way back home so that we can experience God in this place all together as he transforms us from the inside out. That's our word for this year. Everybody say transformation. transformation. And our, our key verse is Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know what God's will is, his perfect, good, and pleasing will. It's possible to know what God's will is for your life. So if you're new here, we focus on a word every year, what we think God wants to do in the lives of each individual here and in our church. And, and this year is transformation. And we become transformed by putting God's word in our heart and letting it do what it's supposed to do. The problem is, is there's stuff that we read that we just wished wasn't in there. Sometimes there's whole like sections that we read and we go, golly, why did Jesus say that? And surely he doesn't mean it the way it sounds. Have you ever read something and go, he can't, he can't really mean what I think he means? Have you ever jumped into a conversation, heard something out of context and went, what are you talking about? And it sounded pretty harsh or it sounded kind of mean or it sounded way too challenging to be coming from someone who says that they love you. And so when we speak about the love of God and we read these super challenging statements, my prayer today, uh, Benet will tell you, my prayer all week leading up to this conversation was not that I would communicate the information of God to you, but that I would communicate the heart of God to you. Because even in his, even in what seems like a, a tough pill to swallow, when he makes a a harsh statement. And just so you know, Jesus made some harsh statements. He, he made some very challenging statements. It was, it was not, it was not, it was not to offend someone. It really wasn't. Was it to challenge them? Yes. Was it to get them to understand God's true heart and meaning, why he exists and what he wants for us? Yes. But sometimes out of our own dysfunction, how many know you're dysfunctional? I'm not raising my hand to make you feel better. I'm we all have a level of dysfunction. We can place in Scripture, this is, I know this, is, this will be revelation, revolutionary to you, we can place our own dysfunction, our own hurt, our own daddy issues, our own relational issues inside the Word when we read it. Did, like, did you know that? Did everybody, everybody in here know you have a lens that you see live through and it's like it's got six-year-old problems? How many know that? Like 12-year-old you problems and... My daddy this and my mama that. Oftentimes in my life when I read a scripture and it offends me and I get bent out of shape, it's not because the heart of God is wrong. It's because my heart of receiving is wrong. It's how I'm seeing it and how it's coming to me. And I go, surely Jesus is not meaning that. Which is why in Matthew eleven six he says, Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Do you know what Jesus knew 2,000 something years ago that we would read his word as he was speaking and walked the earth that people would misinterpret what he said. Now he would say here's, here's the cool news. If you can hang on to my heart when you can't see my hand, when you can know my character when my words kind of seem confusing, then blessed are you because you won't be offended by me. Now he makes that statement because there's a very good friend of his in jail. His name is John the Baptist, and he's about to lose his head. And he sends message, messengers to Jesus and says, hey, I, I just need to know that I'm not about to die for nothing. I need to know if he's, like, for real. How many of you have ever been on the spiritual journey, and it gets tough, and you just ask God, okay, God, if I'm going to do this, i got to know you're the real deal. Like, okay, if, 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 if I'm going to take this step of faith, then I need to know that you're really the Messiah. You're really Jesus the Christ. Like, you're the one true living God. Like, if you're the one, tell me. And Jesus sends back word to John, not, hey, buddy, it's going to be okay. I'll come save you. I'll get you out of jail. I'll come post bail. They're not going to cut your head off. He sends and says, I need you to tell them that the blind are seeing, the lame are walking, the lepers are being healed, but just tell him, blessed is he who's not offended by me. I look at that and go, come on, Jesus, bail your dog out of jail. Like, go, go, like, rescue go rescue him and, and make everybody feel warm and fuzzy all over. But that's really not what he does. He sends the truth. 
And the only truth that sets us free is the truth that we know and that we live in and that we apply to our lives. The truth that we know, we live in, and we apply to our lives is the truth that sets us free. So I believe in that correspondence through messengers, John the Baptist was okay with the sacrifice he had to make for the kingdom. Because he knew in his soul, in his heart, that Jesus is in fact who he claimed to be. So all of us knowing that today, and some of us on different parts of the journey, we're going to look at probably one of the most offensive or sobering statements that Jesus ever made in his, in his and I think in his entire ministry. It's, um, it's just kind of like starting the whole journey out real quick and let's just kick each other in the teeth and be okay with it and, and see how offensive Jesus can be. Because when I read this a long time ago, um, how many of you ever read a scripture and just swore you'd never read it again? You figure one time's good enough for me. Read that, okay, I'll just bypass that. Or kind of get to it and know where it's at and leap down to verse 16 because it was 13 and 14. You didn't really want to read that again. Like, that's how I treated this verse of Scripture. Because it challenged me in a way that made me, check this out, uncomfortable. How many of you ever read Scripture that made you uncomfortable? If you haven't, you're not reading the right ones. You're reading the ones that you agree with. You're reading the ones that you can put on t-shirts. How many of you like the, the verse of scripture? I can do all things through. And that's awesome, right? That means whatever I decide I can do, Jesus is going to make it happen. Let me just tell you, that's not what that verse means. <laughs> I know we got, like, there's a whole t-shirt line of, like, performance gear that's Philippians 4.13 and all the football players wear it. And that's awesome. But he's not talking about I'm going I'm to cause you to make a touchdown. He's saying, when things go south, I'm going to be there with you. When adversity strikes, when it's difficult, I'm going to be there with you so much so that in your weakness, I'm going to make you strong because I'm the one that should be getting the glory and not you. Like, that's what that, listen, I dig that verse, quote that verse all the time, have it hidden in my heart, but I also have to know the context in which it was given, which when I read these few verses, I'm going to wrap them in the context they were given so we can kind of understand them but just to throw them out there Matthew 7 21 through 23 says Jesus speaking not everyone who calls out to me Lord Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven everybody say amen that sucks right how many of you know that's you, you go no 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 especially if you've been in church a while here's what happens how many of you ever argue with the word with the word when you read it have you, ever, have you ever quote scripture back to Jesus when you read a scripture and you go, that's not right? Like it says, not everybody who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. I go, now wait a minute, Jesus. You said in Romans that if I confess with my mouth you are Lord and believe in my heart that God raised you from dead, I'm saved, meaning I'm going to heaven. But right here you say, not everybody that does that is getting in. Now there are some people in the earth that go, see, I told you the Bible contradicts itself. It would seem that way if you don't know the heart of God. It would appear that way if you don't know the context and when Jesus is delivering the message. So that's, what, that's why denominations are created, because we take verses right out of one line and go, this is exactly what God meant. You cannot have a piano. You cannot have symbols. You cannot have, like, isn't it funny all denominations are built on what you can't do? <laughs> like, it's like... Did Jesus not say it was for freedom that I set you free? Did, did not, in, like people say, well, we're a traditional church. We only sit on wood pews and we don't clap and we don't have symbols and we don't do that and we stand up and sit down at the right time. Well, yeah, but like super traditional church, which was birthed through the nation of Israel, yo, they were live, y'all. I'm talking about symbols, one king danced naked. Don't nobody do that in here, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it was, like if we, if we had, like, if we all could just, Go back in time to the nation of Israel. Like when they, crawled, when they got delivered through the Red Sea, they threw a party on the other side, wrote a song, got down. How many of you, ever got, how many of you ain't been saved your whole life? Raise your hand. How many of you lived like a hellion for at least two years or more? Okay, so y'all remember going to the club, right? How many of y'all remember going to the club? How many of y'all can slightly remember college? Okay, so, so like it's all the time, like, why y'all got to have lights and symbols and all that stuff? Well, because when God was following the nation of Israel, it literally says at night he lit them up. So that tells me that wherever God is, it's lit. <laughs> and, <laughs> tweet that. And, 
And they praised him with the lyre and cymbals, string instruments, percussion instruments, everything they could get their hands on to glorify the God that was able to do miracles in spite of them, to deliver them in their sinfulness and their wanting to turn back. God was always faithful. He always walked with them. That's what traditional church, which is why I say Epic Church is the most traditional church in Decatur, Alabama, because we've gone way back. Like, we, we lit up in here. Hey, it makes you feel better. The lights mirror the glory of the Lord when they shine on your face. It's amazing. Everybody say, it's amazing. amazing. So we read this. He says, well, not everybody that says that. We're going to, wait a minute, God. The Romans says if I do this, then there must be something we're missing because God never contradicts himself. God is not the author of confusion. He goes on and he says this. On judgment day, many will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name cast out demons in your name, performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. What I love about this little section of verses right inside Matthew is it messes up every doctrine in the earth. Once saved, always saved. Who gets in, how they get in, and who, when, and how the gifts of spirits flow on. Because these people, Jesus does not know them. They cast out demons, they perform miracles, and they prophesied in the name of Jesus. Now, before you, you go, well, you know, that was before Jesus went to the cross. I want you to just think about Acts chapter 19 because there's a group of young interns under a high priest named Sceva who go out using the name of Jesus to cast out demons. And let's, let's just look at what happened. They, they, meet, they meet a big one. How many of y'all know there's some demons a little bit worse than others? How many of you know that? It's just like, that didn't work. Okay, so, so, so they, they come on this big one, and it doesn't really respond. It looks at them, and the evil spirit answered, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but I don't know you. And then the rest of the story is the demon whoops them naked. How many of you ever been whooped so bad you got no clothes on? Have you ever been to, how many remember that bar party or that, that frat party? Woke up naked and like, what happened? Terry Stevenson knows. Okay, so, <laughs> like, so what I want you to understand is somehow, some way, even though it messes with our doctrine and we don't like it, a person can do all the right things, play the game, cast out demons, prophesy, do miracles in the name of Jesus and not be saved. Because here's what we need to understand as we walk in all of this, as we walk with him and talk with him. It is not you that cast out the demon. It is not you that heals. It is not you that does the miracle. It is the name that is above every name. It is the name of Jesus that when that name is spoken, every spirit must bow. And it does not matter if you're lost or saved. Now, how many are like, well, that's just don't line up with everything that I've ever been taught traditionally. Let me tell you what Jesus is not concerned about, our tradition. He's concerned about our transformation. And he wants us to understand who he is in eternity. How many of you ever played a little game, had some people over, and it's where you kind of sit across from each other and you ask the other person some questions. Sometimes it's played with newly married people, but they throw some older married people in here. But sometimes it can be played with like BFFs. How many of you have a BFF? Come on, Alex, you got one. Right, best friends. I mean, you know, that's rarely ever true, but like, like, we'll be best friends forever, right until you make me mad. Okay, so like, but like, you play this game and you ask questions about, you know, childhood pet, what's your favorite color, what was your first car, and sometimes the answers come easy and people know, and sometimes it goes south, especially like when the, when the couple's been married a long time and they can't answer those questions. <laughs> like, what's your favorite color? Purple. I've never liked purple in my life. I've never been to that party, and it just goes bad. And you go, hey, let's all go get some punch. Okay, so, so it goes really bad. What, what happens? You discover pretty quick, you really don't know them as well as you think you do. Have you ever been in a relationship with somebody for a while, and they say something to you, and you go, well, I, I didn't know that about you. And you feel a little offended that they haven't told you already. Like, well, how come I didn't know that? Why didn't I know you didn't like that? Or why didn't I know you do like that? And so I just want to... Pull some things out of this scripture so you can understand because where this scripture lands in Matthew 
is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And so you've got to understand what Jesus is doing. Jesus is setting up a kingdom, everybody say kingdom, a kingdom, kingdom principle, a kingdom teaching. So if we just go back to the start of Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, he hits on not judging people. He says, you don't want to judge because if you judge, you're going to be judged. And then he, he moves on down. He talks about things like not giving your, your pearls to, to swine. And that's kind of confusing. We're not really sure what that talks about. And he says, ask and it'll be given to you. If you knock, it'll be opened. Um, the golden rule. How many remember that in like Sunday school or VBS or somewhere like do unto others as you would have them do unto you because that's a whole you reap what you sow reality. How many know that? Like if you're mean to people, what happens? People are mean to you. If you're in here and you wonder, why are people so hateful to me? Okay, so, and, <laughs> and then he goes on, he talks about the beware of false prophets. Like, this is where we kind of need to pick up to understand what he's saying. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Everybody say fruit. Which is, he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. If you've been here for any length of time, you know that B'nai and I hammer on that verse all the time. Why? Because people in the South think they're saved because they come to church or they're American. And Jesus did not say that was your identifier. He, he said you'll know my disciples by how they love each other. And he talks about fruit all the time. He, he actually says in this whole little dialogue right here, hey, a good tree cannot, let say cannot, cannot bear bad fruit. But a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you'll recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me. See, that's what happens when your Bible has verse numbers and headings. You think he's picking up a new idea. He's continuing an idea that he's had the whole time. He's setting up kingdom principles. And that he's not really concerned about the information you know. He's concerned about the transformation you experience. He's not concerned about how many times you come to a building. He's concerned about how well you perpetuate the kingdom. And so he's talking about all of that. So the first thing he points out is you can think you know someone, but don't really know them. I mean, we have Facebook friends. Some of you have 5,000 Facebook friends, and they feel like they know you. Can I tell you, if they came to their house, they'd be like, well, I didn't expect this. How many of you ever been to somebody's house that you thought you knew, walked in their house, and went, wow, this is a mess? But on the outside, they looked like their house would smell great, be clean, everything's tidy, and they got 57 dogs and a few cats, and you're like, what is going on? How many of you ever been to that house? Right? How many of you ever been to the house where the guy kind of dresses a little messy, go to his house and it's spotless? And you're like, never been to that house, but I'd like to see it, right? But it does happen. What do I mean? Just because you think you know someone does not mean you know them. Jesus, is, Jesus really wants us to be his friend. John 15, 15, Jesus says, I call you friends. It's all about a relationship. I would say relationship. And you understand this, especially if you're married, because it's not like you woke up one day and said, we're going to get married. You, you, you began a journey with one another, talking to one another, walking with one another, going on dates and communicating and beginning to grow in relationship. And then you made the decision to cross the marriage line. You're like, okay, I want to spend the rest of my life getting to know this person. That is the invitation of Jesus. Follow me. And we're going to spend the rest of our lives together, not me getting to know you, because I know you better than know you know you, but you getting to know me. And not just what I do, but getting to know who I am. We, Benet and I just went on a trip. It was about 14 days, and part of the time was in Africa, and God did some amazing things. I mean, healing's unbelievable, um, preaching the Word. It was, it was crazy. And then we transitioned into vacation, and it was just us. How many married couples are like, 
sign me up. Especially if you have kids. You're like, kids are everywhere all the time. And then you throw friends in, which we all like to spend time with. How I many like to spend time with your kids sometimes and with your friends most of the time? Right? It's like, you know, I like to be around people. But what happens is you, you, it's not that you forget about each other, but you, you stop knowing. And I'm not talking about information. It's, it's this deep place because the word Jesus used here, you don't know me, is used to describe intimacy. It's the same word from the original Hebrew language where Adam knew Eve and they had a son. Now, in, in the United States, we sexualize that and go, oh, so you're talking about the Lord wants to know me sexually. No, no, no. The Lord wants to know you intimately. And so Benet and I went on this trip. I didn't find out any new information about her. But on day three, day three in Spain, no kids, no cell phone, no social media, no nothing. We're just hanging out. I looked at her and said, I just feel like I know you better. Because it had been like 12 years, probably about 12 years since we've been on a vacation without anybody. It was just us. It was the most beautiful thing. And I, I didn't learn her favorite color. I didn't learn the car that she likes. I didn't learn... This is what I'd like to see in five years. I learned no new information. But intangibly, I discovered who my wife is at a deeper level. That's the invitation of Jesus. Information is great. But do you know your friend's heart? Do you know the heart of Christ? Because the second thing we see him saying and pulling out, because he's speaking primarily to the Pharisees in this moment, is... It's not about religion. It's all about relationship. Religion focuses on tasks to be done. Church attendance, serving on an E-team, giving, all of these things that we say make us a great Christian. And Jesus looks and says, I'm just telling you, everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is not getting in. And their response is, is indicative of their heart condition. Lord, did we not do all the right stuff? Hey, I I don't know you. Religion is task. Jesus did not come to set up a religion. He set up to heal a relationship that had been broken because of sin. And that's his invitation. If you don't believe me, look in Luke chapter 10. It's a story of Martha and Mary, and they're both, Jesus is coming over, so one's super busy, and Jesus shows up, and one sets at his feet. Um, Luke 10, 40, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. The Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you worry and fuss about a lot of things. There's only one thing you need. Mary has made the right choice. Martha was running around, cooking dinner, cleaning, doing all the stuff. Mary had sat down at the feet of Jesus and just was with him. There's even no record of her saying anything. There's no record of Jesus teaching her anything. It's just that she's sitting there being. And, and Mar- Martha gets all kind of been out of shape. How many of you ever had a friend that comes up to your house and sits and doesn't do anything and kind of hangs out? And you're like, hey, let's get up and do stuff. And they say, well, can we just hang out? How many of you are like super performance-driven people, and you're like, no, we can't hang out. we got to always be doing something. How many of you have that, have that same dial, that thing in your marriage where you're like, come on, let's do something, and your wife is like, well, let's just sit down, or it's right the opposite, let's just hang out. And it's like quality time. How do, you, how do you define quality time? Well, it's called quantity time as well. It's not one or the other. And you go, we had quality time for five minutes. You cannot have quality time for five minutes on a timer with an alarm. Okay, we're good, let's go. That's, that's what Jesus is saying. Like, look, just... We laugh at the video, but like walk with him, talk with him every day, like a friend, read the word, because John chapter 1 verse 1 says that Jesus is the word, so when you read the word of God, you're reading Jesus, and just hang out with him, and be okay with what he speaks, and where he directs, and where he's taking you, because relationship is just being with God, learning to think like God, then becoming like God, and let me tell you what happened. You'll automatically do the things God would do. But so many times we want to fix ourselves or each other and say, do this. That's not God's plan. 
He just said, hang out with me. Learn my heart. And then there will always be a battle of wheels. God is love. Everybody say love. But he is also Lord. He, he does not desire to be somebody you add to your life. His desire is to be Lord of your life. Because it is in that place you experience freedom and great. And if you're like, I don't know what the will of God is. There's 1,089 chapters to tell us what God's will is. And Romans 12, 2 tells us how. We change the way we think by reading his word, by spending time with him, so that we will know what the will of God is. So there's always going to be this battle. Jesus even showed us when he was to go to the cross. He said, I don't want to do this. How many of you ever had the Holy Spirit tell you to be nice to somebody, to forgive somebody, to move in their direction? You go, God, I don't want to. Can I just tell you what he says? In the most loving way, at least that's how it communicates to me, I don't care. And we take that, as if we have dysfunction in our life, oh, so you don't care about me. No, I don't care what you want because I care about you. I want you to do what I want for you because it's the best for you. How many of you as a parent know that's true? When your kid says, well, I don't want to, what do we say? I don't care. Now, in our dysfunction, sometimes it is. I don't care about you. I care about getting the trash taken out, so let's go. But a perfect heavenly father, when he says, when we're arguing with him, God, I don't want to, I don't care, means I care more than you can imagine. That if you'll do what I'm asking, you'll actually get the life that you want. A man who tries to save his life will lose it. But a man who loses his life will gain it, Jesus said. And it's so counterintuitive to us. But most of us who have lived life long enough know that to be true. The thing that you try to grasp and strive and work to seems to stay just out of reach, doesn't it? Why? Because in the universe, God's still in control whether you're lost or saved. And he says, if you try to work hard and gain it, you're going to lose it. You may lose it in 10 years, you may lose it in 25, but you're going to wake up and you're going to have nothing. What profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? How many people really want to wake up successful, rich, and lonely? Nobody in here, nobody through that camera, and honestly, nobody in the world. But we function in a lie our whole life to believe that's what we want. Because there's an enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Seek my kingdom and my right ways first, and I'll give you the thing that you want. How many of you know that just seems asinine? Well, here's what we say. That cannot work. And God goes, I don't care what you think. I care about you. And if you'll trust me, it'll all work out. I know you think I'm late. I'm sure Lazarus thought Jesus was late. He wasn't. Because Jesus doesn't function on our timetable. Because Jesus did not want to glorify Martha, Mary, or Lazarus. He said, the reason that this has happened is that my Father may get glory. So if you feel like Jesus is late, just hang on. God's about to do a miracle that only he can get the credit for. And that's really what you want. It's just in the waiting, it sucks. How many know it probably sucks to be dead for four days? I mean, that's probably not a good time. And the truth is, you realize that in some area of your life. There's an area of your life that's dead. And it's been dead for a while, and you don't like it. I think God's about to show up and resurrect something in your life today. Because the key to unlock God's life-giving power and to securely place yourself in the kingdom is the last point. It's surrender your life to his. This is so hard. Because I have heard it said from people like me that hold this position of pastor, from platforms like these, I've heard this statement made, which is, biblically untrue there is a prayer to salvation and then there is a prayer where you make Jesus Lord 
That does not exist in the kingdom. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you surrender it all, you'll be saved. You'll be transformed into a brand new creation. Galatians 2.20 reads, It is no longer I who live, but Jesus who lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. That, if you've ever wondered, what is pastor's life verse? It is that verse right there. I quote it every day. When I was a police officer, it was written in my gun belt. That is my life verse because I have to remind myself every day when I get up. I don't, it's not that I'm getting re-saved. I just I center myself in the day that I'm about to walk into to understand it's not about me today. I don't live. I died through baptism with him, and now it's Christ that's been resurrected in me. I'm a new creation. I can flow and function in the Spirit of God because I know who I am and I know whose I am. And I don't doubt my salvation. I am not communicating doubt your salvation. But how do we take this reality of what Jesus said? Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. If your natural response is, but God, I read the Bible. But God, I came to church. But God, I tithe. But God, I, I taught Sunday school. I teach small groups. I've helped people. I've prayed healing over people. I have to be saved. Jesus would say, no. You've done a lot of good stuff. And you've used the name in your communication that is above every name. And you just need to know that my name saves people. My name heals people. My name restores marriages. If you tithe, I cannot lie to myself. I said I would bless you. Lost, saved, redeemed, hellion, doesn't matter. If you gave 10% of your first dollar, I am going to bless it. Why? Because I'm God and my vows are good. But you cannot bank on your tithing record as a deposit to get you into heaven. Your Sunday school attendance, your church attendance, or how many old ladies you helped across the street, none of that matters. The question is, do you know him? But better yet, does he know you? Because he ends a step away. I didn't know you. So I, I want you to know the heart of God today. That he does not give his love in pieces. That whole statement from platforms like this, there is, a, there is a prayer of salvation and then there's a prayer to make him Lord. There is a filling of the Holy Spirit and then he gives you a little more. Sounds like God gives you a little of him a little bit of a time. But God does not give his love in pieces. He gives it all to those who seek and knock. He said, I'm not doing anything to tease you. I'm not hiding myself from you. I am here in front of you today. So here's the question. Do you know Jesus? Or do you know church? And can you speak really good Christianese and know when to say amen and hallelujah? Because that's not getting you in. But surrendering your life, not my will, but yours. God, I've, I've lived my life on my own terms. I've done my own thing. I've done a lot of good stuff, and I don't take any of that away from you, not a bit of it. But please don't bank. Please don't bank on your tithing record, your Sunday school attendance, or your ability to serve on the E-team to get you in heaven. Because if that was it, then Jesus didn't need to come and die. He said, all of us have fallen short and sinned against God. 
And listen, there may be some of you in here, you're, a, like, you're like a legit good person. You've been raised in your church your whole life. You didn't, you've never smoked. You've never drank. But in here, you have some hellless thoughts. You are terribly judgmental. Maybe even a little racist. Maybe you do think about hurting people. Like this is the place that communicates this. And maybe you've never outwardly done much, but inwardly. He says, don't follow false prophets. Outwardly they're good, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You know if we could open up your chest and expose your soul, people would be shocked at the person you really are. There is a remedy for that, and there is a promise connected to the response from the invitation I'm about to give you. Jesus says, if you confess with your mouth that I am Lord and believe in your heart, everybody say heart, that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. But you have to understand this truth. You're falling in love with God because he first loved you. You see your need for a savior. So many people don't think they need saving. They literally think, I'm good. I'm all right. I said a prayer once. I did some Sunday school stuff. I went to camp. I'm solid, man. No, no, no. Do you know him as friend? Do you walk with him? Talk with him? Read his word? Do you bank your whole life on his finished work and him alone? Or is it a little bit of you and a little bit of Jesus? Because if it is, the scripture's for you. But God's heart is he brought you this place today, whether you're through iCampus, Facebook Live, or in here live today to say, I don't care what you've done, but I care. I care so much. I love you so much that I sent Jesus, my only son, to die on a sinner's cross for you. Conquer sin and death one time, once and for all, by raising from the grave so that you don't have to bank on your performance. Because you and I both know it's not that good. I want to show, God, here's what God would say. I want to show you mercy and I want to give you grace. I want to not give you what you deserve because I gave it to Jesus. And then I want to give you more than you deserve through the blood of Jesus. As you stand to your feet all over the auditorium, iCampus, Facebook Live, I wonder if there are any in this auditorium who would have the courage to not play the game anymore. As the staff and the prayer team come down front, that you would just say, Man, the gig is up. This is it. This is for me. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter, but only those who know me, my heart, my sacrifice to pay for their penalty. If that's you, pray this prayer with me. Say, God, Today, I don't play a game. Today, in my heart, I know I'm a sinner. I know it. And God, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. And on the third day, rose to life. And God, today, I confess he is truly Lord. I lay my life down and surrender It is no longer I who live. From this moment, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to step out and come down front and let one of these prayer partners pray with you, give you some instructions of what takes, what we're going to do next, not today, but later. And we just want to celebrate with you. So I'm not going to do anything weird. We're not going to sing a bunch of stuff. But if you prayed that prayer with me today, I'm going to count it for you. Step out. One, two, three. Step out in the aisle and come down front. Come on, Epic. One's coming. One, one broke it. One broke the, the, the silence in the auditorium is coming. Would you give her a round of applause, please? Anybody else? Anybody else?
Let's pray, church. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for a very clear word that brought clarification, security, and encouragement to so many. But God, your word says that you will leave the 99 for the one, and God, we bless you in your name to thank you that you called the one today. That we celebrate with all of heaven as you celebrate over this one that came forward today. I thank you that her life is forever transformed, that she is a brand new creation, that all the old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And we thank you and we accept her into this family here at Epic as you bring her into the family of God, adopted by the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, everybody said.